The Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kaylee Iakina is brought to you by the Ho'omoana Foundation, helping one person at a time. And now, here's Kaylee Iakina. Good morning, Maui. Welcome to the Grassroot Institute. This is Dr. Kelee Akina. It is Monday, December 21st, and almost like every day here on the beautiful Valley Isle, it's a beautiful day. I never get tired of saying Maui is no ka'oi in terms of its people, its places, its weather, and of course now in terms of free market radio, bringing to you the best thinking available on how to build a better economy, government, and society. Joe Kent is with me today from the Grassroot Institute. He leads much of the the top-level research and watchdog efforts. Joe, good morning to you. Good morning, Dr. Akina, and aloha and uh, mele kalikimaka Maui. Uh, welcome to today's show, uh, and welcome to the Grassroot Institute, Hawaii's only independent think tank working to advance individual liberty, the free market, and limited accountable government. Yes, indeed, this is a wonderful season in which we celebrate comings and goings, new things and old things, and we wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Season's Greetings. Well, Joe, what do we have on the docket for today? Well, first, we're going to start uh, with Andrew Walden, publisher of the Hawaii Free Press. After that, we're going to have a visit with Jennifer Suzuki. She's a teacher at Maui Loyana Intermediate School, and she's going to share with us how she is helping students learn about the free market as future entrepreneurs. Next, we'll talk with Nancy Cook Lauer about a new report that uncovers the amount of corruption in Hawaii. You're also going to enjoy listening to Victor Gemignani. We're going to talk with him in his capacity as the executive director of the Hawaii Appleseed Law Center for Law and Economic Justice. And what they do down there is come up with solutions for homelessness and advocate on behalf of the homeless. But we're also interested in his free market ideas as part of the ultimate solution. And finally, we'll tune in with another story in the life of Jonathan Gullible, and we'll talk with author and economist Ken Skulin about Maui's rising prices. But first, we go to Hawaii's farmer's daughter, Joni Kamiya. She's been traveling around the world, enhancing her knowledge about technology, economics, and agriculture, and she brings that wisdom back here to the neighbor islands in order to help advance both the practice of farming and free market economics. Well, Joni, welcome back to Paradise. Did you miss us when you were away at Cornell in New York? Uh, I was a little too busy to miss everything, but now I appreciate it. Well, we're so glad you're back. Hawaii Farmer's Daughter has been away for a while. I understand you were with the Alliance for Science Fellowship. How did you like that experience up there? I loved it. It was eye-opening. In what way was it eye-opening, Joni? Um, it really made me see a whole different picture about our food, ah. where it comes from, and how we get it. Well, you know, science is a big part of the food that we eat, and uh, very few of us realize how much science goes into it. What did you learn about the fact that science is involved in every single thing we eat every day? You know, we really take for granted how good our food is and how mm. abundant our food is, and... The good flavors we get is from science. Oh, is you know, that right? An apple. So it's not just amazing. It's, it's not just Mother Nature by herself. It's not Mother Nature. There's a lot of man made manipulation going on. Well, I like honey crisp apples. Did you learn anything about them? My gosh. To to get them can take a minimum of twelve years for a breeder to get those apples. Is that right? And it's amazing. It took that long, or probably longer, to get that apple. So most of the delicious foods we eat are are delicious, and they're also safe because of the research that has gone into them. Mm Mm-hmm. Exactly. They do a lot of genome testing just to get the flavor, the quality, the texture of the apples. Ah. And even though we're reading it, we're not... We're not afraid of it. It's not just companies and uh, big corporations that are doing this research. I I understand that there's a great deal of publicly funded biotech research that's happening across the world. Did you learn much about that? Yes, there is a wealth of scientific research going on in practically every country of the world um, to grow their crops because 
the research is finding that this is a very useful tool to grow stronger, hardier crops. Give me an example. I, I think you've written uh, about one recently, the BT cowpea. Um, yeah, that for, for cowpea, that's not something we eat as a staple crop. However, mm-hmm. in Nigeria and other African countries, this is a staple. This is like their rice. And when it gets hit by bugs, they have a lot of waste. And in order to grow it without wasting, it's either apply a lot of pesticides to kill the bugs or do something else like biotech to, for them to resist the bugs and decrease the spray. And that's what's happening. But isn't there a lot of controversy over that? Um, isn't it the case that there are people who are trying to prevent the use of that biotechnology in, in order to alter that strain? Yes. Unfortunately, a lot of the resistance to this technology is not from within their country. It's coming from outside their countries. So wealthy, wealthy nations funding activism, going there and hitting the small farmers there and misinforming the growers of this technology. That sounds a little ironic that people come from the wealthy nations that benefit the most from biotech and then they go into these nations where people are starving and just trying to grow enough crops safely and uh, oppose that effort. Yep, exactly. I mean, we talk about home rule. And to me, these countries should have home rule for what they can get from their own research. But isn't it the case that when American companies try to help out in third world nations like Nigeria and Bangladesh, that uh, they're they're actually accused of being uh, conspiratorial, trying to take over the food supply? What do you think about that? You know, a lot of the research that's going on there is actually from within their own scientific community, and it's publicly funded from their own end. So a lot of people mistake that biotech is all American or it's all Western world type of technology, but these people are doing their own independent research, which is, we don't even hear about that side of the story. Is that right? In fact, yes, it it is generally framed as something that's happening because of Western-based corporations, uh, mainly for the profit motive, but uh, as you have written yourself, uh, there's a lot of fear-mongering that takes place, isn't there? There is a lot of fear mongering and that is it's interesting because it's tailored to different places, you know, depending on what their deepest fear is. Is that right? In other words, uh, the, the idea of modifying the, the biotech uh, uh, or using biotechnology to modify the, the plants and the, the crops that we have is connected to things people fear in their homeland, for example? Yes. For example, here in Hawaii, there's a confabulation that GMOs equals more pesticides. You don't hear that in other countries. Their claims against biotechnology is completely different. They tell people that if you eat biotech foods, you're going to become infertile, you're going to become gay, those types of things. But we don't hear that here. So interesting. It's interesting how the... Yes, it changes from place to place. So it just depends upon what a certain culture fears. Uh, You take that fear and you link it to biotech. Yes. Now, you got an opportunity in your research there at Cornell and the programs you were involved in to meet a lot of very famous and very erudite scientists. In fact, didn't you meet Kletwandoi Masiga, the the Ugandan scientist? I did. I did. Um, He has a very interesting background in that he started off as a farmer and he realized, you know, with all the crops and diseases and and the difficulties, how they needed some type of tool because after a while, the same way of pesticides and trying to save the crop doesn't work. They need improved seeds. Hmm in their country. Now farming uh, out there in Uganda is is not just a one of the industries or or a side hobby by any means. Uh, aren't the vast majority of people uh, 60 to 70 percent involved in agriculture and so uh, it, the country absolutely needs to be able to build up its capacity to produce. They sure do. I mean this is the main economic driver for these countries and it's so different compared to the U.S. and Western countries where it's only 
maybe 1.8% of the population is farming. Completely different picture. Well, that's something. You know, as we look at the future of the world, uh, uh, it's so important, as you point out, to understand the value of technology in farming, the importance of science, and it, it really seems to be a, a luxury uh, that we have in our own country to be able to oppose the use of science. Yeah, yes, that we can pick and choose, you know, our foods. We can simply take a cart, go in the grocery store, and there's always an abundance mm. of food. And there's always people growing it. They're so productive that we don't, the majority of us don't need to do it. Well, thank you very much for your insights. I'm looking forward to learning more about what you've been learning representing Hawaii up there and programs that bring a focus on science and the free market. Joni, always great to talk with you. Great. Thank you so much. Aloha. Aloha. You're listening to the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Keli'i Akina. In order to make informed decisions, we need good information. Sometimes the media, newspaper, radio, television only provide us with surface information and commercials as well as viewpoints that come from special interests. So where do you get information that is pertinent, that allows us to see how free market values are being treated in Hawaii? Well, there's a tremendous source. It's called the Hawaii Free Press, and we're here now with publisher Andrew Walden. Andrew, for the last several weeks, we've been talking uh, about the conversion of Maui Memorial Hospital and the state hospital system here on Maui from exclusively union labor to public sector labor. That's a positive move. But lately, uh, you've seen a challenge uh, from Medicare itself. Yes. um, For the 2016 fiscal year, uh, Medicare is going to be cutting the pay of Maui Memorial Hospital by 1%. Well, that's not a good sign. Uh, What was the reason for the cut from Medicare? Uh, It's uh, one of 758 hospitals nationwide, including three in Hawaii. Uh, The three are Maui Memorial, Paliwomi, and Wahiwa General. And the reason is that uh, they have too many uh, post-operative infections and other safety incidents. And uh, in essence, Medicare is penalizing them for poor performance. So this is a punishment, and and it's based upon the past and current management of Maui Memorial Hospital, right? Yes. This underlines the inherent problem with the HHSC, which is as a state-funded operation, it's just not able to pull the resources together to do a good job. Well, I understand, of course, the the penalty here imposed for not maintaining the standards that are necessary for Medicare. But ouch, it's going to hurt because the the very reason we're making the shift in labor and management of the labor is because uh, under the current model with union work uh, rules and so forth, uh, the hospital is just not going to make it financially. Right. And this makes it 1% more difficult to make it. Well, let's hear the latest in terms of the conversion from uh, com- exclusively public sector union labor to private sector with the upcoming role that Kaiser is going to play. Uh, what's the latest here? Um, well, uh, on the first anniversary of his administration, uh, Governor Ige did some interviews uh, with various uh, media outlets. And one of the things that came across is that the uh, Kaiser negotiations over Maui Memorial are ongoing with UPW and HGEA. And the plan is that uh, the existing public workers unions will uh, represent the private sector employees of a Kaiser-operated Maui Memorial. Now, this is an interesting evolution because originally the public sector unions opposed the transition in labor and saw themselves out of the picture. It looks like there's a role for them. What kind of role would this be? Well, that's what the negotiations are about, and they're still opposed to the merger. The UPW is continuing uh, its litigation against this and is requesting injunction uh, in federal court, uh, claiming that the merger would impair worker benefits. What would the positive implication of this be? How could this be good for the state hospital system and the public? Well, the good news is that the merger might impair worker benefits, and that means that UPW members would be able to play fewer games with their overtime. Well, on the other side, what could be bad about this uh, engagement of UPW and HGEA now that we're trying to make a a massive transition to private sector labor? Well, it depends. They could uh, sabotage the entire process. On the other hand, They could come to terms with the fact that this is the future and they need to write a private sector style 
contract, which actually gives their members a higher pay rate in exchange for fewer work rules. And so instead of making a living by playing games with your overtime rules, you actually make a living by doing your job. What a concept. As we look at the rest of the state, which is focused very much on Maui and what's happening with the labor conversion, what are the implications statewide for the future of the unions and hospitals? Um, well, uh, according to Governor Ige, uh, he sees the entire 13 facility state HHSC hospital system moving to private management. He sees that as part of the possibility. And if this process is successful, that could happen. And if UPW and HGA can come to the terms, come to terms with the idea that yes, they will continue to control these 5,000 workers, which is what they want. They want the dues money and they want the voters. Then, um, they can work with this future. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the dinosaurs within Union uh, hold sway, then we could have a, su- a substantial setback. It looks like this is a bit of tough navigation uh, because the, the visions don't seem to align. On one hand, we have a vision of moving closer to the free market in terms of privatizing the labor, and that should entail many benefits in terms of cost efficiencies and uh, service. On the other hand, we're clinging to a structure we've had for decades here in Hawaii. Uh, what could be the reason that, that we can't see these as two separate issues and, and they come back to each other again? Well, it's human nature. Visions never do align. But within Hawaii, we see project after project collapsing, most recently the uh, Mauna Kea telescope, uh, before that the super ferry. And so can this particular project of privatizing hospitals collapse? It most certainly can. This is Hawaii. It's the way it's done. Andrew, I'm not seeing much outside of Hawaii Free Press uh, in terms of discussion of the contract, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of the future implications and so forth. What, what, what gives you that unique perspective at HFP? Uh, to be honest, uh, this is being discussed. It's just uh, buried in the coverage. I, uh, you know, is a lot of this information is in Pacific Business News, the Star Advertiser, but it's paragraph 25 instead of paragraph one. Well, I guess it should be up front and looked at very closely for those of us concerned with the free market. Thank you for being with us today. Aloha. Andrew Walden, publisher of Hawaii Free Press, available at hawaiifreepress.com. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back with the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kelly Akina. Have you ever wondered, why is milk so expensive on Maui? Why is my rent going up? Why are there so many homeless on Maui? The Grassroot Institute is here to help. Since 2001, the Grassroot Institute has been Hawaii's only independent think tank working to bring people together around solutions that work. For a free copy of our top 10 solutions to ending the problem of homelessness, visit our website at www.grassrootinstitute.org. We'll also give you our weekly report, our TV show, and a podcast just by signing up for free at www.grassrootinstitute.org. See you soon. We're back, and you're listening to the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kelly Akina. As we like to say here on the Grassroot Institute, Maui is no ka'oi, and shining brightly today is Maui Va'ena Intermediate School. They took first place this month in a very important contest. They won $25,000 in the American Savings Bank 2050 Keikiko Contest. And so we're going to get to talk with a teacher from Maui Va'ena Intermediate, Jennifer Suzuki, to discuss how her students are learning to become entrepreneurs. Jennifer Suzuki is a teacher at Maui Waina Intermediate School. Welcome, Jennifer. Hello. Thank you. Recently, your students won $25,000 in the intermediate division at the American Savings Bank Keiki Coat Contest. What did you folks have to do to win the prize? Um, well, American Savings, we've been doing the American Savings Bank for Education plan or program for about three or four years now. I'm not sure how long it's been in play, but um, my local representative, Jamie Duclo, um, and I have been trying to get our school to win something. So this year when it was actually creating a business plan and a video to explain your vi- business plan, we were both really excited. Um, I have, I think, 29 groups working on it in my different, my four different classes. <laughs> 
and they're seventh graders, and they were to create a business plan. So they had to come up with an actual product that they thought was feasible, um, important, and um, of interest to them. So they all came up with their various projects, and then they had to um, devise a mission statement. They had to identify their target audience. They had to um, figure out how they would get funding if they were to actually bring their plan to fruition. Um, and then they had to create this five-page business plan. Wow. So this is something that um, a lot of d- adults have trouble with, um, coming up with a yeah. bus- business plan. Um, did you see some of your kids um, struggling with this? Yeah, it was really funny because um, Jamie and Chuck um, Dondo, who is, uh, I guess, the Maui president for the American Savings Bank, they came to bring the kids pizza yesterday, and they were asking the kids, so what was, you know, what did you think of the Kiki Cook contest? They were like, it was hard. <laughs> like, it was just really hard. <laughs> Do you think that's part of the lesson, too, that um, it, it is hard to be an entrepreneur? Oh, definitely. And I think, I think at their age, they might not understand it as, like, an actual business, but just the planning of anything is really difficult. You know, whether it be, like, planning opening a business or just planning a party or something. I mean, it's really a difficult process to figure out what you actually want to do um, who you're doing it for, and how you're going to actually accomplish your goal. It, it's, it's huge. Well, what were some of the um, the products that kids worked on? Well, a lot of them did, like, um, everyday products that, you know, that they were familiar with. So we had scented lotion for men. We had um, somebody wanted to do, like, a backyard fountain that was pretty because his mom wouldn't let his friends come in the house to get water. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Um, we had one group did the uh, semicolon bracelets, trying to raise money for the semicolon project and and actually stay in business themselves. Um, we had a lemonade stand, a couple babysitting operations. We had a travel bottle set that um, fit together so you could hang it on your bathroom wall, but you could also take it apart so that you could use it as travel bottles. Okay. They were really creative. They came up with all kinds of different things. And um, what what was the product that won the contest? There's a, a boy named Ethan Harris, and he was working with two other boys, George Frendo and Alkai Ayet. And um, they first were thinking about doing like a science game, but they were having a really hard time with that. And so Ethan actually has cystic fibrosis. His life is, you know, kind of a constant struggle. So he, um, so I said, you know what, go go to your guys' lives. Like, what would make your life easier? Because I think coming up with a good product is the hardest part. So he said, well, I have to travel to Oahu, like, every three to six months to go and have this um, spirometer test so that they can test his breathing. But when he travels, he has to miss school because they're only open on weekdays. He has to fly in a plane, so he has to wear this, like, gas mask looking apparatus because if he gets sick it's super serious um he has to you know travel to the hospital where he's again exposed to a lot of germs and stuff like that and it's just really exhausting expensive so he said well if i could just do this from home if i could monitor my own breathing from home that would save so much time energy money and all that so i have a fitbit watch you know that tracks my steps and my heart rate and stuff Oh, okay yeah so it's a Bluetooth. And so he was saying, well, why couldn't we just do that? You know, create like almost like an asthma pump looking with some kind of a, so he could breathe into it. It would get larger and then the sensors would send feedback to um, like an app on his phone that would say how much air capacity he was pushing out. That information would be instantly transmitted to his doctor so they could keep a kind of a running record on how his breathing was doing. I guess if they can catch an infection with him, or his, his breathing getting less efficient weeks in advance, then they can start him on medication and treatment earlier to avoid, like, severe sicknesses. So that was I kind see. of what it was. Doing. So he can um, self-monitor then, and he doesn't have self-monitor. to go all the way yeah. to Oahu and get on the plane and, and all of that. Um, that's fantastic. And did he um, put a business plan for that together? Yeah. So they, you know, and he did research on how many people actually have breathing conditions. And so there was a definite market for it. Um, And then he planned on trying to sell it to like um, at medical trade shows so that they could do it 
so that he could sell it to the doctors or to hospitals or clinics so that they could be like, so that he didn't have to direct sell everything. Yeah, and um, then he even looked into how to get it patented by the American Medical Association so that insurance would cover it. And he found out that would take two to three years, which I didn't know. But um, so if there's any medical companies out there listening to this, you should contact me. That's right. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea. And uh, what did he think when he uh, won the prize? Oh, he's the funniest kid. He's super humble. And he's like, well, that's great, but... Um, so are we going to make it? That's the sign of a true entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. His parents came to that. He's got the most amazing parents, like totally the most supportive. I mean, their life is so difficult and it doesn't even save them. So he's, mm. a, he's a lucky kid. Great. Well, um, congratulations on that product. And um, was there anything else or any other lessons that um, your students learned about this process? The most important thing about the entire project was, as you can see, Ethan was like very close to home and personal, and he's passionate about it. I think that's the key to the successful projects, was that they actually cared about it. It wasn't just an assignment. It was something they really wished they could do. So I think once somebody can identify their passion, then then everything else is a little bit easier. Passion is a good thing when it comes to business. Yeah, definitely. Because you can't be a cheerleader for something you don't care about. You can't go out and work endless hours and and bring something to an actual product if it's not something that you think is important. Great. Uh, thanks again for, for teaching us this lesson and, uh, and helping win the prize. Okay, thank you, Joe. Jennifer Suzuki is a teacher at Maui Wana intermediate school. Her students recently won the $25,000 American Savings Bank Keiki Co. Contest. You're listening to the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Keli'i Akina. One of the saddest blights on the beauty of Maui is the fact of homelessness and also the lack of affordable housing for those who are really in a bind financially. It's been growing as a problem. It seems as though no solution is easily on the horizon. But today, I think we'll find some positive news by listening to Victor Gemignani in an interview I did with him. He's the executive director of the Hawaii Appleseed Law Center for Law and Economic Justice. We're going to talk about the homelessness situation and how free market ideas could be a big part of the solution. I'm proud today to be able to introduce to you a new friend of mine. Victor Gemignani. He's the co-executive director. He's been the founder of the Appleseed Center for Law and Justice, fighting for the rights of the least advantaged here in Hawaii. Victor, welcome to the program. Welcome. You pronounced my name absolutely perfectly. You must have some Italian in you. <laughs> Gemignani. <laughs> oh, paisano. Well, aloha to you. Aloha Lucky you live Hawaii, right? Oh, absolutely. We do. And absolutely. You, you know, just at the outset, you've got a fabulous education. Mm. At one point, you had the opportunity to be a corporate lawyer in the Wall Street world and so forth, but you've decided instead to advocate for the poor and devote your life to that. You're, you are actually one of the leaders in that field, pioneering legal advocacy for the least advantaged and bringing that to Hawaii, mm. and you founded the Appleseed Center. What, what do you attribute Hawaii's rising homelessness problem too? Well, it's not complicated, to be frank with you. It's fairly simple if you start to connect the dots. If you have a person that is low income in the state, we'll say earning sixteen, seventeen, twenty-five thousand dollars with a family of four, they're confronted with the highest cost of living in the United States. They're confronted with the highest cost of shelter in the United States. Fifty percent, or I'm sorry, seventy-eight percent of the people that are living at or near poverty, and that's the level I just gave you, are spending more than fifty percent of their income on shelter alone. Normally, uh, the economists say you should spend no more than thirty percent of your income. So you have a tremendously expensive state. Electricity, food, food's one hundred and sixty percent more than the mainland. Electricity is off the charts. Secondly, you have the lowest wages paid in the United States when you ultimately factor in cost of living because we have such a cost, high cost of living. When you factor in like, what wages people are actually being paid, statistically, we have the lowest wages paid in the United States. We call it the price of paradise. We want to live That's here, right. so we sacrifice. We all do that. And thirdly, we have a tax system that's one of the worst in the United States. It's actually the 
third worst in the United States in terms of taxing people, uh, low and moderate income individuals, and middle class individuals, I'd say also, uh, because of the way we set up our tax system many, many years ago in the 30s to actually emphasize GET as the primary vehicle to generate a lot of dollars, about half our dollars that are generated on a revenue base come from GET. That's a highly regressive tax and hits right. the low income more than any other population. And so, we're going to talk a bit about that more, but basically what you, you're outlining is that if we do the math, if we add the numbers up, it should be expected that the Absolutely. least able to survive here are, are going to be less Absolutely. able to survive. Anytime you have a crisis year. in a family, you have domestic violence, you have drug abuse that occurs in one of the children, or the, God forbid, one of the parents. Uh, you have a loss of job. You have anything that occurs to disrupt your ability to, to actually work on a day-to-day -day basis. You're 40, 50 hours a week you're working. You're going to be on the streets because you're going to miss two or three rent payments while you're trying to recover from the economic fall. We don't have a capacity to be ultimately have pop, pe a large enough population that's secure paycheck to paycheck to ultimately not have what we have in the streets there today, a burgeoning population, and you will never stop that population until you deal with the structural issues that I just mentioned before, because they'll always, as long as those structural issues continue, have a pipeline to homelessness. Well, this is what had brought us together, actually. You were a member of a panel that Grassroot Institute recently sponsored entitled Free Market Solutions to Homelessness and Affordable Housing, and, and we looked at the fact that the poor are being squeezed from both directions, from the bottom up in terms of the problems they struggle with, whether it's mental health or uh, being laid off or whatever perennial problems they face and from the top down in terms of the condition of our economy and the tax structure and so forth and, and we just really need to do something about both of these solutions do you see a lot going on in terms of transforming the economy or dealing with at a policy level with the needs of the least advantaged I do I see nothing happening well let me say on, on the tax policy issues we were able to is a, is a thing called GET food credit that's right. been in existence since the 70s to somewhat take over take, uh, take care of the aggressivity of the GET tax let's take a second segue here for, for our viewers to, to talk just a little mm -hmm. bit about what you brought up, the GE tax. Mm -hmm. GET taxation here is on virtually everything. It's a pervasive tax. It raises about half of the money in the state coffers, so it's like a sacred cow. But the people it impacts the most are those with the lowest level of income. They could Low spend, and moderate income. They Absolutely. could spend up to 13 to 15 percent of all of their income on the GET tax because they are spontaneous buyers. As soon as they get money, they walk into a store. They don't have time for tax strategies and they and can't so save They're and, spending and, everything and, they get immediately. And that's what you meant by regressive yeah. because it actually hurts the least able to pay. Yeah. But one they of the pay more of their income than other individuals that's right. do. If you're making ten dollars, uh, you're going to spend a dollar thirty on taxes in the state if you're low income. If you're making ten dollars in your upper income, you're going to spend about eight eight uh, eight dollars. There you go. It's a it's a significant change in terms of the regressivity as it goes up the income and, schedule. And I don't think a lot of people realize how much the poor in our community care in terms of the weight of the GET tax. I mean, we, we, we look at things that we want to afford overall for everybody, like the uh, fixed rail uh, in Honolulu, uh, other projects that the legislature brings up every year, and we say, let's just raise the GET by a quarter percent or a half percent, but we don't realize the regressive nature. But you've done something, but I want to ask you about that. You mentioned that you, Appleseed was helpful in getting a tax credit for, uh, on the GET for the, the least advantage. Yeah. But how many know that and how many file their taxes in order to get the credit? Well, that's a good question. Uh, the majority of people that are ultimately eligible do, in fact, file for the credit because they file their 1040s at the end okay. of the year. Uh, and it's included within the context of the, of the filing for the 1040s. So if you're going to file a tax return, you're going to know about the tax credit likely, especially if you have the form, you follow the form because the form does, in fact, have an, the, uh, the, uh, the ability for you to actually implement But on a tax. very practical level, how many can wait for a return? Uh, I, mean, I mean, when you're living from day to day, oh, week to week, month to month, you know, January is coming and then April 15th is coming and then the check is coming and so forth. Um, I, I, I think the direction is, is commendable. <laughs> But, but it really is a drop in the bucket, isn't it? We would agree. I mean, I would advocate for a total realignment of our tax structure if we could, but unfortunately, there's not the will to do that. So we can pick and choose the areas that at least there are in the tax code. So it's not a matter of introducing right. a new concept. It's a matter of just in bringing up to inflation uh, the uh, credits that have already been given in the past. The Grassroot Institute, almost every time we go down to testify on bills related to tax, brings up the impact on the poor. Let's return now to the question of what causes yeah. poverty, what causes the um, homelessness that we see. Yeah. 
in it's addition not, to the systemic yeah. economy, yeah. What, what are the it, real issues? Again, it's not complicated. With? You have those four issues I mentioned in right. terms of the structural problems that people have to overcome if they're going to be able to survive appropriately. But secondly, you need an ability to actually rent someplace. We have not done any affordable housing rental creation in probably 40 or 50 years. I have not found one. That's Absolutely. In, in fact, affordable housing has been for those that are going to be owning homes right. at 20, 120, 140 percent of AMI. There's been nothing built for those 60 percent of AMI below. By that way, that's about $57,000 for a family of four. Nothing built. In so, fact, uh, we had a developer from the Island of Maui at the panel at which you spoke yesterday at, at the Grassroot Institute. He reported that the only affordable housing that has been completed in 10 years has taken nine years and is still being developed. And those are 60 units. And can, he can count on one hand the number of affordable homes that have been able to get through the developmental hoops, the zoning laws, the regulations, and the community hearings, and so forth. Uh, as well as the financing, because there's not a lot of profit in uh, low-income housing. What people would much rather protect, the developers in particular, is presume uh, uh, develop housing that's ultimately going to be more profitable, which means uh, large houses, which go for uh, uh, $600,000, dollars $900,000. So the profit margin is so low in, in rental housing that there has not been the ability of government to try to figure out exactly how they'd lower the price. And there's a whole bunch of answers to be able to do that, to be frank with you. But they all require a change of attitude about what our crisis is and how we're going to prioritize res resolution of that crisis as opposed to uh, bis continue business as, as usual. And so when we talk about free market solutions, we're, we're saying really to the government as politely as we can, don't interfere with the free market. Don't have such measures with regard to regulations, zoning, and so forth that inhibit market forces of supply and demand mm -hmm. meeting together. Well, Victor, I want to thank you very oh, much for pleasure. joining thank us you for today. The invitation. I look forward to working together more in the future. Absolutely. My guest today has been Victor Gimignani of the Appleseed Center for Law and Economic Justice. I'm Kili'i Aquina with the Grassroot Institute. Don't go away. We'll be right back after this short break. Have you ever wondered, why is milk so expensive on Maui? Why is my rent going up? Why are there so many homeless on Maui? The Grassroot Institute is here to help. Since 2001, the Grassroot Institute has been Hawaii's only independent think tank working to bring people together around solutions that work. For a free copy of our top 10 solutions to ending the problem of homelessness, visit our website at www.grassrootinstitute.org. We'll also give you our weekly report, our TV show, and a podcast just by signing up for free at www.grassrootinstitute.org. See you soon. We're back, and you're listening to the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kelly Akina. There's a new 50-state report out put out by publicintegrity.org. It ranks Hawaii in terms of overall corruption compared to all the 50 states. Well, we're now down near the bottom. We got a D-plus rank, and there are very few states out there that are as bad as us in terms of what measures as corruption. Now, how do we measure the corruption? Well, there are a large number of variables that are examined in this report. Nancy Cook Lauer, an investigative reporter from the Big Island, was the one who put this information together for the state of Hawaii. We're fortunate to have her on the line now. Nancy, glad to have you on the radio today. How are you doing? Great, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Well, you know, I would just need to congratulate you for your recent work with the State Integrity Investigation. What a great report. Uh, all 50 states examining the ethics and t integrity of the state governments. Is that what that was about? Yes, it was about... Um it, it was about it's the susceptibility of state governments to corruption, and it was basically done by looking at 246 different variables. Uh, each each of the researchers, there was a researcher in each state um, who went through and and did and basically researched the law and you know what the law says about certain aspects, very particular aspects of of transparent government transparency, political financing, executive accountability legislative accountability uh, components like that and then went in and through a series of, of interviews with key players and also research of the media and and um, and various d different interest groups finding out how the, a law applies in each state wow so yeah. that that's quite a bit <laughs> of research and so you were responsible for tracking all of those about 250 variables here in the state of hawaii over the last year how long have you been doing right. this work uh, this particular project started a year ago so we started 
for uh, late December. As I look at the results now, Hawaii, unfortunately, ouch, doesn't do very well again. We're, we're, <laughs> we're ranked near the bottom as you compare us to the work in all other 49 states. Uh, it looks like we got a grade overall of D plus in terms of our integrity and the corruption in our state government. Is that right? Yes. Uh, yeah, we did. That was the bad news is we got a D plus um, in the rankings, uh, but we actually came in fourth in the nation as far as the best. And that's the really bad news that oh everyone else is doing so much worse. Yes. You know, that's astounding, Nancy, that the states in general are doing so badly in terms of integrity and the level of corruption. Why do you think that is? Um, it's really hard to pinpoint, but personally, and you know, obviously I have a bias because I work in the media, but I think that the watchdogging has, has really fallen off with the, with the media having so many financial problems and downsizing to the extent that it has, that the watchdogs aren't there as much. Now the nonprofits have tried to step in and fill the gap, but there's still not that daily, uh, you know, the, the, reporter in, at the county council meeting or at this legislative session watching. Yes, and I would imagine that in a state like Hawaii, which is predominantly one party, you don't have another party performing the role of watchdog. And with so few exactly. watchdogs, people get away with uh, almost anything. Right, and that one-party system is a huge, that's a huge factor in Hawaii. I know Senator Sam Sloan does his best <laughs> as the only Republican in the state Senate, you know, and, and he does try to bring things out, but, you know, he's one guy, and and, the re and there's only a couple reporters, as I said, and, you know, there, there are interest groups, but but they tend to fall in with 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 the majority. That's so right. So it, it becomes difficult. That's right. And even those Democrats that want to fight for transparency, like Senator Leslie Hara and others, find a, it's an uphill battle in many ways. Now, I'm looking at this report card that Hawaii gets, and, and many of mm -hmm. our grades, in fact, almost all of our grades are C's and D's, <laughs> public access to information, political financing, electoral oversight, executive accountability, and all of this. But there's one that just jumps out as a flat F. <laughs> and that is lobbying disclosure. Tell me a little bit about that. Laws are not all that strict about lobbying disclosure in that the Ethics Commission tries to to get the forms and and but there they, there's really no watchdogging of whether people even file their forms and one of those was a really blatant example that came with the Land Use Research Foundation, which describes itself on its website as a strong and effective advocate and lobbyist uh, for land developers, but we're, we're not even filing lobbyist disclosure forms for years and years and years. So it's like five years or so. Right, and right. it was And it wasn't even noticed because uh, the form, you know, when the forms come in, the Ethics Commission, which has a multitude of tasks and forms and disclosures that it has to process regularly. When the lobbyist forms come in, they check them, you know, to see if, if they make sense. But there's not a lot of independent analysis, independent research auditing of those forms. And if someone doesn't file at all, well, they just sort of slip right through. How about that? And, you know, that's so unfortunate because really much of the power that that is wielded in our state is done so through lobbyists. Now, as I'm looking at the grades here, uh, one mm -hmm. of the factors that probably gives us a little higher standing compared to other states is the fact that we've got pretty good access to information. I know that our state database system makes a lot of the government information available and so forth. So it makes us look good in terms of our sunshine laws. But uh, when we at Grassroot Institute and other investigators try to get information, we, we find that um, there's a different story. Any, have you had any experience with that? Yes, the, there's a lot of information available, um, and but it's not all. It's it's not always the information that people really want. The nuts and bolts of the information. Now, the, the the state in general has been doing a good job of pushing out information, but it's generally the information that makes them look good. So, but. Uh, for example, you know, the court, the judiciary has been doing a good job of, of pushing out, treating all the court cases as they, the decisions and orders as they come through, which is, which is very helpful for reporters that are trying to track court, court documents. However, trying to actually get the court documents, uh, like the, you know, the details of the motions, 
Uh, it's still difficult in this state because it's not all online yet. Nancy, did you try to take uh, this information to the governor's office and uh, see what his response was to this? Uh, yes, but the governor wasn't ready to talk about about the report um, in that we could not release the entire report to him to get his comments, and they wanted to wait until after the report was published. I have not tried since then to talk with him about it. Well, very good. I look forward to hearing more from you as you continue to monitor the level of integrity and corruption in the state of Hawaii. Nancy, thank you so much for your good work. Oh, you are most welcome, and thank you for having me. Nancy Lauer is an independent investigative reporter. You can read about her report on the website of www.publicintegrity.org. You're listening to the Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kelly Akina. One of the most important efforts that we must stand behind is the education of our young people and indeed all people in free market economics. A free society needs to have an educated society. And one of the best ways to help bring about that education is to expose young people to a wonderful work by grassroots scholar Kenneth Scullin called The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, A Free Market Odyssey. Each week we've been playing a portion of this and then Ken and I talk about it. Listen now. As you may recall, we last left Jonathan Gullible on a remote Pacific island after his boat was blown far off course by a terrific storm. Eager to learn about the inhabitants of this island, Jonathan was wandering the streets of a town and came across a large red brick building. Hearing the noises of machinery inside, he turned to a passerby and asked, Does this building house a printing press for an island newspaper? Printing press, yes, but not for a newspaper. This is the official Bureau of Money Creation. We print up lots of money in order to make people happy. I would also like to print money if it would make people happy. Oh, that is out of the question. Freelance money printers are called counterfeiters and are thrown in our zoo. Why? You see, when counterfeiters print up money and spend it, this robs the value of other people's money. Wages, savings, pensions. The money becomes worthless. But I thought you said that printing up lots of money makes people happy. This is true if it is official money printing. If it is official money printing, we call this monetary policy, and it is perfectly legal. Those who spend the money are not robbers, they are politicians. And lots of people are happy when the politicians spend money on them. But didn't you say that money printing robs the value of wages, savings, and pensions? The people who lose wages, savings, and pensions are often ignorant of the good that comes from politicians spending their wealth. But maybe they are happy too. After all, ignorance is bliss. Stay tuned for another exciting episode of The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, jonathangullible.com. Ken, I love the way you make the obvious so much more obvious in Jonathan Gullible. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kelly. You know, this is actually a story, a true story, of um, when, when Ludwig von Mises, the famous Austrian economist, who was a, an official in the finance ministry in uh, Austria during their time of, of hyperinflation, uh, officials uh, called him and said, uh, how are we going to stop this inflation? And he said, I'll meet you down at such and such a corner in the morning tomorrow. And uh, they, they were puzzled. And they went down there and they met him. And they said, what, what's going on? You want to know the cause of the inflation? Do you hear that noise in the building next to us? That's the printing press. You want to stop the inflation? Turn it off. Absolutely. You know, this is really a parable about the short term versus the long term. In the short term, when government runs out of cash, all it does is print more and expect to get a good result. But in the long run, the effects are disastrous. What are some of those long run effects of printing more cash than we really have a value behind? A lot of people think that if prices go up, it it affects everybody the same, but that's absolutely not true. There's a redistributive effect of inflation, winners and losers when there's inflation. The people who are the losers are the people on fixed wages, who have savings and pensions, who are expecting their money to be worth something in the future to spend it. But they're losing value when there's inflation. The people who are gaining, though, are the people who are in debt. They get to pay off uh, uh, with cheaper money. People who own gold and land and uh, museum collectibles and things like that. And the government is the biggest um, owner of debt, of land, of gold, of, uh, uh, of collectibles, museum collectibles. And they're the ones that get to print the money and spend it first before the prices go up. So they're overwhelmingly have an interest in seeing inflation occur. 
So this redistributive effect really takes from the poor and gives to the rich. So the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. In some ways, we rarely think about the person who's hurt by government policy, monetary policy, as you put it. Yes, and you notice how what an uh, outrageous clamor there is against deflation. They don't want prices to go down, but that would be enormously beneficial to the poor because their wages and their savings would actually able to be buy, buy more. But the people who would be hurt would be the people in the categories that benefit the most by inflation. Well, you know, deflation, I don't know if that's all that bad a thing. I remember when you'd have to own a football field in order to house a computer, and you'd have to be one of the wealthiest persons in the world to buy it. And today, anybody can go out and get a telephone that's as powerful as those big computers. The costs of technology have gone down tremendously, the costs of so many other commodities. Isn't that what we call deflation? Yes, absolutely. And it would be a tremendous income increase for all of us uh, uh, if we saw deflation because it would mean the same number of dollars that we have would be able to buy more goods and services. And we had that in the country during the time of the gold standard. During that time, there was slight deflation through over 120 years of American history, which meant that people were actually getting pay raises by being able to buy more with their money. But ever since the government went off the gold standard in 1933, we've had nothing but inflation. We've gotten so used to it that we think it's as inevitable as a volcano. Now, in the broadest sense, when when we were on the gold standard, there was a principle at play, and that was that the paper money had something actually backing it. Now we've moved far beyond that. In fact, uh, what backs money today? (laughs) Well... Uh, they say it's the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, and actually that's pretty pretty bleak. Faith and credit? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. There's nothing backing it at all. Um, and uh, the only reason that the dollar seems strong is because it's falling in value at a slower rate than many other, most of the other currencies in the world that are experiencing even more inflation. And uh, with the $3 trillion that the federal government, the Federal Reserve Board, has printed up in the last few years, I would expect um, big inflation in the near future. There's already been money inflation. We're just waiting for it to be reflected in prices, but the amount of money has certainly uh, diminished. It seems as though there's one commodity we simply ignore when measuring our wealth, or at least in the way we give any kind of financial education to people today, and that's the value of the money itself. Uh, Like other commodities, commodities, it's subject to supply and demand, isn't it? Uh, Well, and the government, that's why the governments throughout history have wanted to have a monopoly of money, why they call it legal tender. You're not allowed to compete with them. And they don't want, they don't trust uh, competition in, the, in uh, currency. Because if you did have co- competition, people would choose the stronger currency. And uh, they wouldn't, then the government would have to be very careful how much money they printed up if people could use something else like gold or, or uh, banknotes or something else that was... Uh, preferable as a currency for exchange. So the government establishes legal tender laws and puts people in jail who uh, might offer alternative currencies. Let's explore for a moment what might happen if the government didn't have this monopoly on money, if we could choose our own mediums of exchange. Well, then everybody would choose to use a currency that was going to keep its value. And my guess is that people would prefer maybe gold or gold-backed currency, maybe even Bitcoin, something that they would prefer to the U.S. dollar. Now, if they wanted to use the U.S. dollar, they they would certainly be allowed to do so, but they would also be allowed to pay their taxes and have debt settlements in the courts uh, with other currencies as any contract would allow. And what do you see as the impact on the economy of this kind of free market with regard to money? Stable money, it's the best way to ensure that people could trust each other. Consider what money is. It's a promise to repay uh, to finalize a, a, an exchange at a time later. And with the diminishing value, you're essentially robbing people of that ability to make promises to each other in con- contracts and, and obligations and even savings. What a great vision. Wouldn't it be wonderful someday to have a free market, Ken? I would love it. <laughs> Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Kali. Ken Scullin, author of The Adventures of Jonathan Gullible, A Free Market Odyssey. Well, Dr. Akina, another great show. It sure has been, and it's been great because our listeners are Noka Oi here in the county of Maui. Signing off today, this is Kelee Akina with Joe Kent for Grassroot Institute. Aloha. The Grassroot Institute with Dr. Kelee Akina is brought to you by the Ho'omoana Foundation, helping one person at a time. 
If you'd like to get a copy of our show, visit www.grassrootinstitute.org. We'll see you next week at 7 a.m. right here on KAOI. Thanks for listening and mele kalikimaka.